Many of us have encountered the important principle of compassion in our spiritual journeys, most notably, of course, in Buddhism, but of course, we find that in many spiritual traditions. Kristen Neff is a psych psychologist and researcher who developed the idea of self-compassion some decades ago and did a lot of research into this idea of how we can achieve our emotional well-being ourselves, how we can rely more on ourselves to achieve the contentment we seek. So much of the, that contentment is assumed by things outside of ourselves. As long as this is okay, as long as the kids, as long as my job, as long as my finances, as long as the world or the country are okay, I'm okay. And while those things may very well be true, it's an extremely tenuous and in fact volatile way to achieve any kind of compassion. In this uh, show, we've frequently spoken about the Stoics and how the Stoic principle of taking charge only of what you are actually in control of reduces this reliance on external things to achieve any kind of balance in our lives. This is what Kristen Neff in her book, Self-Compassion, is really interested in. This is what she says. She says, self-compassion is a powerful way to achieve emotional well-being and contentment in our lives. By giving ourselves unconditional kindness and comfort while embracing the human experience, difficult as it is, we avoid destructive patterns of fear, negativity, and isolation. At the same time, she says, self-compassion fosters positive mind states such as happiness and optimism. The nurturing quality of self-compassion allows us to flourish, to appreciate the beauty and richness in life, even in hard times. When we soothe our agitated minds with self-compassion, we are better able to notice what's right as well as what's wrong, so that we can orient ourselves towards that which gives us joy. Powerful words might seem obvious, but why aren't we doing it? We do attach so much of our happiness to things that are outside of us. And at the very least, Neff is saying, the key to happiness is yourself, just as the Stoics have told us all the time, that if you identify where you actually do have influence in your universe, you can ensure your happiness, your contentment, as long as you understand how it depends on you. So she says there are three primary components to self-compassion. The first one is kindness to yourself. Basically, we need to be more kind to ourselves. We beat ourselves up all the time, and that obviously is not going to get us very far. Secondly, recognition of our common humanity, recognition that our suffering is your suffering, someone else's suffering, that we share the human experience, and that includes suffering, a common part of the human experience. And thirdly, and very importantly, mindfulness. By observing our experience, by holding it in what she calls balanced awareness, without trying to push pain away or make it into a bigger deal than it needs to be, that's how we can achieve some self-compassion. So let's have a look at these three principles and perhaps consider how we could cultivate them in our lives. So the first principle is being kind to yourself, self-kindness. Of course, we all can do with more kindness in our lives. But if you think about it, so much of the unkindness in our lives comes from ourselves. You know, we criticize ourselves all the time, even in the smallest ways, from things like saying, oh gosh, I've been such an idiot, or I can't believe I just said that, or I always do that, I'm such a fill-in-the-blank of some kind of adjective that describes ourselves in a negative fashion. We heckle ourselves. 
we're constantly pressing at ourselves. Some would say, you know, it's the voices of the inner parents or identify where in life it might come from, wherever in life it might come from. <laughs> One thing we all share is a tendency to do that. And while being self-critical can sometimes lead to positive results, the way we do it as this kind of heckling on ourselves or pulling ourselves down is counterproductive. So Neff's definition of self-kindness is stopping self-judgment and stopping this constant disparaging internal commentary that we pretty much assume is normal. It's so common that it's normal. So in order to do that, to shut down that voice, we have to understand our failings and experience some compassion towards ourselves about them, rather than condemning our failings and condemning ourselves because of them. It also means that we need to see that we are doing harm to ourselves. Neff calls it an internal war that we are fighting with ourselves. And if you think about it that way, it begins to make sense that for every couple of steps you try to take forward, we're pulling ourselves backwards with this internal law that's saying you're doing that wrong, could be better, there's something wrong with you. So there's stopping that. But as she says, self-kindness needs more than just stopping the self-judgment. It also needs an active principle of comforting, comforting ourselves, which might sound ridiculous at first, but we're very quick to comfort someone else when something's wrong in their lives. When we experience a friend in need, we rush to comfort them. It gives us a sense of we are being helpful and meaningful by comforting them and unmistakably has the desired effect. That's why we do it. So why don't we do it to ourselves? We should self-comfort in order to achieve that same thing. She says, we need to allow ourselves to be moved by our own pain. We need to feel that compassion that we feel for someone else. So we could stop to say, this is difficult right now. How can I care for myself? How can I comfort myself in this moment? We, we need to say something to ourselves to soothe and calm ourselves. She says, make a peace offering to yourself of warmth, gentleness, and sympathy from ourselves to ourselves. It sounds so simple, it verges on even sounding cheesy, but it is so real because we just don't do it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it's so obvious. Obviously, that's true, but why do none of us do it? So try that. Be, offer yourself a peace offering. Whenever you find yourself about to criticize yourself for anything that just went wrong or whatever the reason may be, turn it around. Be sympathetic. Allow yourself the opportunity to self-heal. Simply just be nicer to yourself. It's such a small thing. It's such a big thing. Although we often seek some kind of personal purpose and meaning through our spiritual paths and through other things, one of the things we actually acknowledge by pursuing that in a spiritual path in the first place is that we share our human experience with everyone else. That despite the fact that we experience our own individuality and feel and believe that we have our own personal path, we will often look for that in the words of ancient masters who might be dead for centuries, even millennia, or even of living masters, but yet in a book that millions might be reading. We recognize intrinsically that we share our experience, our emotional, our psychic, our spiritual experience with all other humans. And of course, we share everything else. It's frequently pointed out. We share this planet that we're so busy destroying. Why do we destroy it? Different issue, not for discussion here, but ultimately we have our common humanity. We are all in this together. And the second 
very fundamental principle of self-compassion is to recognize that, that we have a common human experience and that we are all connected to each other. In fact, not only connected to each other, but we are interconnected to nature and life itself. So self-compassion isn't just about accepting ourselves and loving ourselves. Those things are important, but they are not enough on their own. They leave out the critical fact of other people. Self-love is not about ego, although it often sounds like it to our ear when we discuss it. And sometimes we even have to like qualify that we don't mean the egotistic, narcissistic version of self-love. So something that really distinguishes this concept of accepting ourselves and being compassionate on ourselves is recognizing that we share this with other people, that our self-love is incomplete without these other people, because as Neff says it, compassion is by definition relational. Compassion literally means to suffer with. And that means we're sharing it with the rest of humanity. There's a basic mutuality, she says, in the experience of suffering. The emotion of compassion is a recognition that we share this difficult, imperfect experience with everyone else. I feel for you because I know how bad it is because I feel it myself. This drama of living, this challenge of living. As she says, why else would we say it's only human when we comfort someone who has made a mistake? So self-compassion recognizes that all humans are fallible, that wrong choices, that regret are inevitable things that we will all experience. So we can recognize that in someone else, we can share that in someone, and we can feel compassion. As she even says, even the high and mighty will feel these very same feelings, something we easily forget, be it celebrities, our modern high and mighties, or people in power, I guess they're also our high and mighties, everyone actually feels the same things. Remember that saying, a clear conscience is usually the sign of a bad memory. So we need to remember how we share this human experience, that we share this human experience. So when we are in touch with this idea of common humanity, that this is a shared experience, then we know that feelings of inadequacy and feelings of disappointment are not unique to ourselves. We can talk about my inadequacy and my disappointment, but we recognize in doing that, that we're actually sharing it. It's something that belongs to all of us. It's not really mine. It's my experience of disappointment or inadequacy, that common human trait. We don't actually own it all ourselves. And Neff says, that's what distinguishes self-compassion from self-pity. When self-pity says, poor me, self-compassion says, we all suffer. We are all human. We all deserve and can receive comfort. So it's kind of like self-pity says, poor me. Self-compassion says, poor us. There's obviously something we need to do to lift ourselves out of that. Basically, the pain I feel in difficult times is the same as the pain you feel in difficult times. Maybe the ingredients of it are different. Maybe the triggers of it are different. And of course, the circumstances of it are different. The degree of pain is different, but the pain, the process of pain, the results of the pain, the things I tell myself are the same. 
no judging of my pain is worse than your pain. We're human beings. We share the pain of being one. Neff says that the third key ingredient of self-compassion is mindfulness. She says, mindfulness refers to the clear seeing and non-judgmental acceptance of what's occurring in the present moment, facing up to reality. The idea is that we need to see things as they are, no more, no less, in order to respond to our current situation in the most compassionate and therefore effective manner. That's her definition of mindfulness. So she points out what we know from many of the great masters that suffering is caused by resisting pain. We can't avoid pain, but we don't necessarily have to suffer because of that pain. Suffering is caused by the resistance to pain. We can distinguish between the ordinary pain of life, difficult emotions, physical discomforts, pains in our body, and actual suffering, which is the mental anguish caused by fighting against the fact that life is sometimes painful. So that pity, that self-pity multiplied. You know, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. The pain will happen. How we respond to that pain determines our own levels of suffering. Resistance to the pain increases the suffering by trying to convince ourselves that whatever happens um, is more significant for me, it's more significant than what's happening to the next person, is significant in some way because it's unfair, the suffering increases. How do we compare one pain against another? That judgment is a trigger for suffering. It's a, often a reason to suffer or justification for suffering. My pain is worse than yours. I lost someone. You just lost your job. There's no measure of that because all suffering is really caused by ourselves. There may be categories of more or less pain, but the suffering doesn't have to be more or less. The suffering doesn't have to be. As Kristen says, our emotional suffering is caused by our desire for things to be other than they are. But when something has occurred out there in the world, there is nothing we can do about it. We can't change anything that's in the moment. This is how things are. You can either accept that or not. Whatever you do, whether or not you accept it, reality remains the same. So you can choose to suffer by responding to it, by fighting it, or you can cultivate a healthier relationship with reality through mindfulness. And for Kristen Neff, mindfulness can be achieved through noting what's going on. She says, the practice of noting is to make a soft mental note whenever a particular thought or emotion or sensation arises. This helps us to become more consciously aware of what we are experiencing. She says, for example, if I note that I have become angry, I become more consciously aware that I'm angry. If I note that my back is uncomfortable as I sit, I become consciously aware of my discomfort. This then provides me with the opportunity to respond wisely to my current circumstances. Perhaps I need to take a few breaths to calm down. Perhaps I need to stretch to relieve my back. The noting practice can engender mindfulness and be used in any situation. It changes the response. Instead of the reactive response that says, poor me, my back is sore. Oh, damn, my back is sore. I didn't go to yoga again, my back is sore, self-blaming. We respond by saying, my back is sore, what should I do? And that noting allows us through that mindful practice to actually reset ourselves. And one of the things she says we need to reset is our expectations. Everybody makes mistakes. It's just one of those things. 
So why would you be any different? <laughs> why would any of us be any different? The idea that we should be is somewhat absurd. And yet, when something goes wrong in life, when we fall down in life, as she puts it, we tend to take the attitude that something has gone terribly wrong. Whether it's because of me, or blame someone else, we do both of those things. But this idea that something has gone wrong, that it should have been other, why should it have been? How could it have been? None of those things are true. The first step, remember, of mindfulness is accepting how things are. And mindfulness is one of the key ingredients of self-compassion. So we need to reset our expectations. We need to, in order to have compassion for ourselves, we need to recognize that making mistakes is normal. Falling short of our goal is normal. Life not being perfect is normal. It doesn't mean we'll never achieve that goal, that we'll always make mistakes. It simply means making mistakes is normal and achieving successes are normal. You can't say one is right. They're both part of the everyday human experience that we all experience. Finally, she has a look at things like success and motivation, because as you've heard, much of what we're talking about is this tendency to pull ourselves down and judge ourselves as lacking in that success in some way, not achieving the success. But a lot of research has been done on people who are motivated and people who tend to succeed at their goals. And people who succeed the most, of course, are people who are self-compassionate. In order to be effective, we need to be self-compassionate. And researchers who do study motivation and success find that people who are most self-confident are people who are most successful. That ability to believe in yourself and be compassionate about, uh, to yourself, to accept yourself and then work from there is directly related to the ability to achieve our goals. Self-efficacy then is our belief in our own abilities. It's a very important part of our ability to really achieve our goals, achieve our potentials. So that's why it's so important to understand that resetting expectations, being self-compassionate, doesn't mean we resign ourselves to the facts of the human condition, or that we resign ourselves to, we get it wrong, we make mistakes, I can't achieve that. It means that we are compassionate to ourselves about it but we can motivate ourselves through still believing in ourselves. Remember, self-compassion means we don't criticize ourselves and say, you can't do that. Self-compassion means we say what we would say to someone else. You failed this time, but you can do that. You have got it in you, it just wasn't quite the right time. We need to say those simple things that we all know how to say, but we were saying them to other people. Ultimately, I believe that not only will self-compassion improve our efficacy and improve our experience of life and ultimately improve our ability to achieve all our goals, self-compassion will also help us experience compassion for everything and everyone else. We started off by discussing Neff's principle that we are so busy being compassionate to, be, to everyone else, why aren't we compassionate to ourselves? And that is true. But it's also true that we aren't really compassionate enough to everybody else. That we criticize and judge other people at the drop of a hat. And we might deem ourselves justified. We criticize the government, we criticize warmongers, we criticize corrupt people, clearly justifiably. But the great lesson of all the spiritual teachers is ultimately shared humanity. That we need to have compassion for those who make errors because they are the same as us. If we to be compassionate on our own errors, we need to be compassionate 
on others. If we learn to not judge ourselves, we could learn perhaps to not rush to judgment of others. It's a great lesson for this time of the year. It's a great reminder of what this period of the year, when we get to reflect and share and give, is really all about. Ultimately, the greatest gift you can give yourself and to others is compassion.